Hello, Alex. How are you? Hi, nice to be here with you, Nizam. Thank you. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to interview you. Yeah, it's an honor. Let's see what happens. <laughs> yes. So friends, we have Alex here. He's a hypnotherapist who helps people connect to an inner source of love and wisdom after graduating from Pomana College with a degree in psychology. He became a Buddhist monk in the Thai forest tradition. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> After several years of meditation, he returned to lay life to study hypnotherapy and body psychotherapy. He now attends to individual legacies of harm with clients filling in the holes left from childhood, as well as unpacking trauma from histories of genocide, slavery, and all forms of oppression. He um, walked towards his path to awakening attempts to balance the masculine and feminine spirit and mundane individual and collective. Such a beautiful journey and it's wonderful to know about you, Alex. So please tell me, how did a psychologist end up in Thai forest for meditation? <laughs> well, they're very closely connected actually because they're both dealing with pain. And for whatever karmic reasons, I experienced some kind of existential pain, this, this question of why are we here, right? There's a lot of pain in the world. There's wars and child abuse and ecological destruction. And it's like, all these bad things are happening. Is there something that makes it worth it? Is there some metaphysical principle that matters and that lasts beyond you know, the span of this lifetime or the span of this experience. Because I felt in my heart, if there wasn't some greater reason, I didn't think it was very good. <laughs> I didn't think it was really worth it. It's like, okay. there has to be some better reason. And um, psychology tries to help people with their pain, but it doesn't necessarily answer that question. You know, it says, yes. Yes. you know, we, we, we don't know. And religion has a, has a lot of answers two um it was actually during an ayahuasca ceremony that i got my clearest answer in my heart so i had you know i didn't do drugs of any kind for many many years um learned how to meditate work energy in the body but still maybe not so clear experiences and so yeah it happened i was in an ayahuasca ceremony in Brazil. And uh, this was actually right before I did the hypnotherapy training. Mm -hmm. And it became very clear. It was like I plugged into the spiritual internet and I could download answers. You know, so if I send up a question, <laughs> is there meaning in the world? The answer is like, yes, there is. Feel it. Open your heart. Notice how everything is connected. You know, there in that ceremony, there would be birds, you know, off to my left. And they would be kind of making noise. And I sensed that it was connected, that they were expressing some energies that I was personally in touch with. So it wasn't a, a random event. And that's actually, you know, when I tap into that space, it becomes very clear that life is intelligent and that the world, the external world that we th scientifically think of as concrete is aware of my heart and is teaching me. <laughs> and to have that transformation, to, to live life in touch with that place of surrender and trust and connection is a very different experience than how I originally, you know, approached the world and how many people in, in the world these days approaches the world as some sort of um, cold or needing to create something rather than calling in or, or trusting a deeper intelligence. So creating an ego in the world to kind of take care of business. Um, okay, this makes me think of something, which is um, this model of, of a self that I find very helpful. Oh. Okay, so we have three <laughs> circles here. And the innermost circle is that connection to oh. life and to God, right? It's this overflowing. Um, sometimes I've experienced it as a golden core of 
of wood, like a tree that is gold in the middle. It's like, and then the very crust, the very outside is um, pain, things that we're ashamed of, you know, the, the anger, the, the greed that we have that we don't really like, doesn't feel comfortable. And we often try to hide it with the external mask of, um, I'm a very nice person. I'm a very peaceful person. I'm a very powerful person. But it's almost a compensation that tries to hide another inner experience. And so I would say most people are going to live kind of in touch with this mask area. And they have some insights of this deeper pain that really scares them. It might feel like a dark hole, a black hole, oh, okay. um, the, the end of the ego. And they don't they don't want to go through that and they don't necessarily access this <laughs> this heart of life that is good and beautiful oh, okay okay and so a lot of my work is about okay let's sit with that pain mm -hmm. because it's not the end all be all of who you are it is not who you are it does not define you it does not make you bad and let's sit with it and let's make space for it and let's see if there's a, a response from something greater hmm. So recently I was sitting with a client and, you know, asking question after question to kind of deepen, deepen, deepen. We finally get to a place where it's pain of aloneness, existential aloneness, and it feels greater than, uh, it feels ancient, you know, bigger than them. It's like, okay, we're sitting with this and immediately it, in my mind, it, it's like, all right, well, we need something that can hold something so big and it's not going to be a part of the personality, right? So we call, okay, like, is there an energy here that can hold this, right? And there was, there was a, you know, an, an ancestral energy of love that, that was able to respond to that. Wow, wow, amazing. So it's like, if, if you think you're just your ego, that kind of huge existential aloneness is very scary because the ego can't do anything about it. Right. But if the ego knows about God and love and divine qualities and can out of faith ask for help, then in my experience, help always comes. You know, I grew up Christian or at least raised, you know, Christian and, and going to Sunday school. And there was a few times when I experienced deep pain and I called on Jesus and I felt better and I didn't make that much about it. Um, you know, looking back on it, I'm like, oh, there was always help. You know, that's nice. But I kind of took it for granted or didn't put a lot of weight on it. Um, but it's been my experience that when I when I'm in deep pain and I ask for help, help comes and help can come in so many different ways. It can come in dreams, it can come in books, articles, Facebook feeds, um, you know, these algorithms that can do so much harm like they can also do good yes and there's so many ways that life can respond but it responds particularly to our intention and so if we go through life thinking that we have it under control and we don't ask for help help can't necessarily get in it doesn't necessarily land even if it's trying and so if somebody comes to me for help like whatever is motivating them to reach out, that is what's going to help heal. Yes. You know, I don't heal anybody. <laughs> um, I, I hope that I create a container that's safe and connects people to resources that can heal them, but it's, it's God, it's greater than, than me. And um, yeah, so I would say one of the beautiful things about the alchemical hypnotherapy training program and modality is that it connects people with, I'm getting a little bit of an echo. It connects people with heart and God. Okay. Yeah, Alex, you are telling about all chemical hypnosis and your journey and how it connects us for in a course. So please share more about your experience. Well, I feel like I completed that part. Um, what else would you like to know about? So I, I want to know, like, how did you get into all chemical hypnosis? What do you like most about it? And how is it unique from other 
mm. forms of it. Yeah. So I was living in a Buddhist monastery and I was meditating mm -hmm. and I felt some stagnation. Mm -hmm. I felt some longing to be more connected to my culture, more able to offer service in the world, um, more able to use the intellect that I, that I have. Mm -hmm. In the monastery, it's very focused. You give up everything, social relations, intimacy, intellectual curiosities, and you're sort of diving deep into the essence, which is very beautiful. And that can lead to total awakening. And we each have our own karma and our own path. And I was trying to understand an experience I had had of psychic opening. And in the traditional ascetic traditions, they, they ignore it. They say, hey, don't even go there. Just focus on awareness and, and buy, like, don't go where you can get lost and stuck and confused. And that's a valid path, it's a valid choice. But it had happened to me and I, and I needed to understand what had happened. And so I read a lot and there were different things that were helpful. One was a model by Ken Wilber that talks about the evolution of consciousness, both in the individual and the collective. And so it starts with a mythic level. There might be one before this, but there's a mythic level, <clears throat> which would be traditional indigenous cultures. And um, taps into a real reality and, and has a beauty to it. And I don't want this model to be like so linear, but it was helpful to understand a particular point. So I'm gonna explain it. So you have the mythic level and after the mythic level you have, which you go through in childhood, by the way, you have a rational level of consciousness. So you can see this in the Western world. It's like, we have scientific principles. We wanna understand the laws. And that has its own beauty and its own pros and its own cons. And I would say that's maybe where I started with my upbringing in childhood is very rational. There's a level beyond the rational where you're open intellectually to another reality that's more synchronistic or metaphysical or magical. And so you begin to read certain things and open your mind to different ideas about quantum mechanics and what does it mean that as you observe an electron, how you observe it actually determines the physical form of the electron. Like, what does that mean about the world? <laughs> um, so there's, we call that visionary. Then you have psychic. So psychic is where you're more actually experiencing that other reality. So you might hear a voice that, that says, you are an alchemist, follow this path. Or you might uh, see different things you might feel in your body, you might know, you might have dreams of the future. Lots of phenomenon that have been explored in parapsychology. And then beyond the psychic, you have non-dual. Right, so this is where the aesthetic traditions are pointing. It's like, don't go to psychic. You want the experience of union. You want to know the source of your being that is connected to the physical world and to, you know, all of existence. And that's way cooler. And I agree. Yeah. Um, I just ha happen to to have found so much value in some of the psychic um, phenomenon. You know, hearing from teachers who maybe don't have bodies, and you know, I found that fascinating and interesting and helpful. So I'm, I give a little bit more credence to that. Like, wouldn't you want a voice in your own heart that says do X, Y, or Z if it's going to actually be good for you? And you have to determine, you know, is this something that's trustworthy? Um, there's a moment in my life that illustrates this principle I was trying to decide where to go to college. I had applied to a bunch, you know, of seven different schools and I got in down to two. You know, do I want to go to a little liberal arts school in California or a small liberal arts school in Minnesota? And I just sort of 
put them on each hand. And it's like, do I want to go there? Do I want to go there? And one was just more, more exciting. You know, my heart kind of lit up with excitement. It's like, I want to be in California. The weather's better. There's cool geography. The people are interesting, more diversity. Like you could think of reasons, but it wasn't, the, the reasons came later to justify the feeling. It was just a feeling of, I'm more excited about this. Hmm. And a lot of my intuition is actually felt in the body. Okay. So in, in alchemical hypnotherapy, there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, seeing certain things. And it's an interesting journey for me to personally maybe see some things, but they don't necessarily feel real even unless they're connected to a, a feeling in my body. And it's an interesting working with clients too, who don't necessarily see things. Some people do, and it's really fun to work with them. You know, I can just say, go into the heart of love. And they're like, it's beautiful. Of course they feel yeah. it too, but you know, they, they respond really, really well and really easily. Okay. So I was saying that, you know, I, I was in the monastery, I was reading about the different levels of reality. And I was also reading about the wisdom that comes through hypnosis. Hmm. So people like Dolores Cannon, Michael Newton, Brian Weiss, um, they would either spontaneously or through induction help people access wisdom. Yes. And crazy things would come through. Like Dolores Cannon said, maybe 1% of the people sort of give this really powerful universal wisdom, but she would record it and transcribe it. And she wrote a bunch of books about it. And this wisdom, which is beyond space and time, or it's beyond our, our egos, at least, is coming through regular people who are doing guided meditation. And I was just fascinated by that. And I was fascinated still by resolving emotional issues. I didn't feel like I had resolved some of my trauma uh, through my practice of meditation. And so I was like, all right, I wanna study hypnotherapy. And I researched all the programs. And I picked the one that was the most spiritual because I was in that esoteric world already. You know, there's some programs that are, we're the most medical hospitals like us doctors. And I was like, no, no, that's, that one's not for me. But there's one guy who's like, uh, when I got into the school, David Quigley's like, this is a, this is a mystery school designed, designed uh, disguised as a hypnotherapy program. And I see his work as, you know, drawing these people who are very spiritual and maybe have, Cool. You know, Native American past lives or, or Native past lives. And we sort of awaken this reality and say, that, yes, this is beautiful. This thing that society has never seen in you has maybe run over with a truck because you were so sensitive. This is beautiful. And this is the answer to all of your life problems. Exactly. And just giving that affirmation <laughs> is so empowering. They're like, oh my God, that feels so good. And oh my God, the crows are talking to me and I'm having these dreams. And part of the mind freaks out because it's, you know, I'm going to lose all my friends. I'm going to be stoned to death, burned on the stake. There's histories here. And yet it's exciting to come together and say, well, actually, this is a beautiful way to be. This is actually the way that the world needs to be so that we don't self-destruct, right? Collectively, we're at this decision point. Do we die? Do we destroy the basis of our life? Or do we find a new way of being that's in harmony with with the crows and the orcas and the whales and the trees that honors the intelligence that is in all things. Okay, so I was telling you about- yeah, um, so That's how you landed into alchemical hypnosis. So then I, then I went to the program, <laughs> I went to the program and um, I was like, oh my God, this, this is a genius. These techniques are very intuitive. They felt very powerful. Um, they personally aligned with my own sense of what I would do. And the teachings were empowering as well for me to, you know, find my own way and um, to, to, yeah, to, to, to bring it into the world in a good way. And that was a long learning process. You know, I would work with clients and then I'd work with friends um because at the beginning i just wanted to work with anybody yeah. and i would notice when i worked with my friends that my voice would seem somehow more authentic or more me and then when i would work with clients there would be more of a 
act that I would put on. And sometimes theater is helpful, but for my own sense of integrity and growth as a professional, I was like, how can I be that authentic person in both? You know, how can I show up and just be myself and ask questions that are interesting, but in a voice that isn't putting on a show, right? Because if I'm over here talking about masks, like I don't want to put on a mask to try to help somebody take theirs off, right? So you have to actually walk the walk. And that is a spiritual, personal, psychological practice unto itself. Yes. How do we continue to grow as, as beings? And, um, you know, I've studied a lot of psychology, neuroscience, and I always enjoy it when I find teachings that are exactly what David Quigley teaches. So for example, one of the basic teachings is, hey, you know, as a kid, we didn't always get all the unconditional love that we needed. And so let's do that now. And rather than you having to be the unconditional love that you've never experienced, let's call on inner parents. Let's call on a, a mother and a father and meet them and, and have them love you whenever you need, you know, outside of the office 24 seven, they'll, they'll be there for you. Um, well, actually, this is the gold standard treatment for repairing attachment. Yes. You know, they have people imagine an ideal parent and receive love for it and have it be an embodied experience. And this is called a corrective experience, right? It helps heal that trauma. And they don't talk about it in a way of this person you're imagining might have a consciousness unto itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't talk about like spirit guide therapy. Um, but I imagine that people who are in that therapy have those kinds of real experiences. experiences. And, they're, and they're not necessarily held or um, valued. You know, so one of the things that's nice about coming from the more esoteric side and being as mundane as somebody needs me to be is being able to acknowledge, oh, yeah, yeah that makes sense. That's real. That happens all the time that's valuable, that's important. Yes, <laughs> more, more of that. Amazing. Yeah, so in my training, connecting to that level of um, inner parents is very helpful. Um, you know, I, I found somebody to trade sessions with for many, many years um, to help solidify both my experience as a client and as a practitioner. And it's amazing the breadth that this modality can help and affect. Yes. And, you know, I've thought for a while, like, what is it that I want to specialize in? You know, you oh, could be an okay. asthma specialist, you could help child abuse, you could, and I think there's some value in, in specializing. And I think particularly reflecting on our own life experience for what our struggles have been. Mm -hmm. you know so I've known this existential pain right so that's something I can help people with it's like oh you you worry about being alone existentially or that there's no meaning in the world um another thing is that transition from rational to psychic to non-dual which I think is so needed in our in our world today um so a lot of people will come and they're they're ripe and they're ready They've been intuitive all, all their lives, but they haven't had intuitive healers and they haven't been empowered to use those tools to heal themselves or transform their lives. So people will come. And one person I met with three times, it was like one time, maybe like six weeks later, maybe six weeks later. Um, but through those sessions, you know, they connected to an inner guru right? They connected to an aspect of divinity. You have your pick, right? Like St. Teresa, Gandhi, Jesus, Buddha, um, so many, so many options, whoever you want, right? And whoever your karma connection is with, that your heart is resonant to. Um, I have a connection with Jesus. So, you know, I can call on Jesus and it is a feeling in my heart. I don't see a man, I don't know if he's a man or a woman or whatever, but it's like a feeling in my heart where there is another dimension of love and power and trust and intelligence 
And, you know, through three sessions with somebody, I can help them make that connection where they're able to, whenever they have emotional problems, turn to this, whenever they want to write poetry, turn to this, whenever um, they want to go to sleep, you know, (laughs) for help, ask, ask. And it's, in a way, these beings are you, right? It's not like, it's not outside of your body or your experience, but sometimes because our sense of self is so limited, we need to project our higher self onto another being who we trust and love. So in a way, um, you could work with your higher self or you could understand that this being is your higher self or it is your connection to, to God, which is not separate from yourself. Um, so I don't want it to be disempowering, like we need to turn our lives over because it is actually an aspect of ourselves. Exactly. But given the options of, you know, going to alcohol, going to addictions, uh, you know, spewing out our anger in words, or going to, you know, Jesus or, or whoever, it's like, I'm going to go to this one. And then at some point, if that one becomes limiting, you know, Ramakrishna, for example, really liked Kali. Yeah. And love Kali devotional, very beautiful. And then at some point, life, God said, like, you need to relax your attachment to this one figure and understand that Kali is an expression of something that's actually greater and has many other expressions. And so, you know, in a very beautiful way, he did that. And, uh, but then he, and then at the end, you know, he can go back to devotion to Kali, understanding the essence of it and not being attached. Or sometimes people think that their own understanding of truth is the only way, right? And there's, um, there's some fear or something is a little off in that, in my, in my opinion. Okay, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. And uh, how beautiful this is, this work is, right? Unlike other forms of hypnosis, Alex. And uh, uh, did you get to see your past lives or your own guides? Like you have already said about your guide. Did you, do you have any experiences with your past lives, etc., Alex? Well, you know... In my time at the monastery, I um, was really searching for answers, and I I um, asked for some psychic people to kind of like read me. Mm -hmm. And there was a past life there connecting to my present life that felt very real. And so during the training program, we go down the steps into the past life, and I went there, and I don't know. You know, it would have been cool if I had seen it myself, but the emotions were were real enough and I, you know, processed it like it was. And um, I did, I did some past life regressions outside of, of that as well. And I would see things, but I didn't, I didn't know if I was making it up or not. And um some of the past lives that have come most strongly actually have come through dreams. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like very lucid and and awakening dreams and a a screen gets pulled down and my head gets kind of pointed at it. And I see these uh, very graphic movies without a lot of connection or story. And then after I wake up, I kind of piece it back together. So for whatever reasons, the past lives haven't been so clear or powerful or important oh, okay. Okay. for me. But uh, the thing that I will say is there's a sense of existential isolation that feels very much like a, a soul level or, um, you know, many past lives. And so it's been a practice to be present with that experience within that context And for me, it hasn't been so important to see particular past lives. There's been people who have explained to me that, you know, we all have different soul origins and maybe my soul didn't 
grow up on Earth and isn't so used to this experience of this particular frequency and density. And that makes a lot of sense to me. And so in meditation, we, we are present with what is, and we don't always have to understand where it comes from. Yeah. So this is a, you know, in a lot of therapies, you really want to understand the context. And I think it can be very important, but I don't think it's necessary. Yes, yes, totally agree with that. And with past lives, the way that I prefer to work with it is in the context of what's painful, right? So some people, they have neck pain. I would rather go back to the root cause of that neck pain, see a guillotine, than go looking for the guillotine lifetime and not know whether that's actually connected. Got it. And uh, any healing experiences of you or someone whom you helped with alchemical hypnosis, Alex? Something you remember? Some of the most clear are those ones that have to do with the physical problems. Mm -hmm. You know, people who had um, anaphylactic shock. Okay. And we go down to the root cause and there's, okay. you know, there's, you know, green potion, maybe like a curse or something. And we, we deal with it. And then the anaphylactic shock is gone, right? And they didn't come to me asking uh, you know, with that as, you know, why they came to see me. But along the way, we, we like, you know, saw that out the door or, you know, recently kidney stones came in and we went down into the kidneys and there was a lack of forgiveness. Um, and so we, you know, sort of forgive and they pass and it's gone and there's some lesson learned. It's not, um, you, you know, like in that process, actually something in their life has to change. Mm -hmm. We can't just like clear away the problem, otherwise it'll be recreated. Um, so that's also an important piece of, of learning. If you go to the surgeon, they're going to help get the problem away, but they're not necessarily going to help you understand what in your life is out of balance that led to the disorder being created. So those are very clear. I think um, having a direction in life is probably mm -hmm. the most important. Because a lot of people come and they are a little bit lost. They think there's more in life, but they don't know exactly how to get it or what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. And they might be stuck in a job that takes a lot of their time, but they're not necessarily expressing their soul's desire to you know, perform or create art. And I think that that piece that is most important is like, what direction are you headed? Where is your north? Do you want to go towards peace and love and authenticity? And are you willing to walk through your greatest fears? And do you trust that you'll be supported by life? Not by me, the therapist, but by God, by the source of your being. You know, are you willing to take a step in that direction? You don't have to be willing to go the whole way. You don't have to know anything. Are you willing to take the next step? Are you willing to forgive yourself for not being further along? Are you willing to, you know, open your heart to the pain of your childhood? And it's not always so clear, you know, it's like, yes, yes. I want to say yes, but I'm also very resistant. I can feel this plate against my chest. Um, and so it's like, okay, let's stay with that plate. Let's, let's breathe with it. What is that protecting? How is that protecting you? Where did that come from? You know, understanding with awareness exactly where we are before we try to change anything. Um, I guess sometimes therapies can be a little bit quick to offer a solution or to change, or clients really want that. You know, they're like, I'm so sick and tired of this pattern. I want to be done with it. I'm like, great, great. That's beautiful. You're so clear. And before we go there, let's just sit with exactly how it is right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's accept this because if we come in with a bulldozer trying to get rid of a pattern, that pattern is more powerful than us and it's going to sabotage and it's going to come back. And we really need to understand with awareness exactly what it's doing for you and how we can do it better and we can work with it. So that's another beautiful thing about alchemical therapy is giving empathy to each little part. You know, fear shows up. Oh, hi, fear. Like, what are you scared of? 
impatience shows up. Oh, I get it. You want to make a change, right? What are you scared of? Okay, deep fear shows up, you know, and we can understand each piece and stop having them fight each other. There's a uh, metaphor in the Buddhist Pali Canon about a bunch of animals tied together. You got an alligator and a monkey and a frog and a lion and an elephant. And, you know, they're all pulling. One wants to go to the swamp, one wants to go eat this tree, but they're tied together and it's a, it's a big mess. And some people are overpowering and the lion starts attacking. And in the sutra, this is talking about your different senses. It's talking about your desire to see and hear and touch. Um, but it's a good metaphor for the different parts of you too. <laughs> you know, one of you. Beautiful metaphor, Alex. Thank somebody you. wants to get drunk. Somebody wants to watch TV. <laughs> somebody wants an awakening. Somebody wants to go running. And it's a hot mess. And it's like, okay, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, Alex. It was like, you know, a uh, psychologist turned into Buddhist and Buddhist turned into hypnotherapist. And, you know, now using all that, everything at one stage had one purpose. So now using everything, you're doing amazing job helping people, especially with the existential issues like who am I and what am I doing with life? And there comes Alex answer for the questions like you know this is very deep work Alex thank you once again for sharing your experiences it was wonderful knowing your journey thank you once again yeah you're very welcome it's a pleasure to talk to you today thank you bye